Garbage, welcome to our Facebook Live this evening. We're going to give it a couple minutes to allow people to get into the event. And then we're going to get started. I'm going to show you guys tonight how to make the pumpkins that are behind me. And we'll show you different steps to do coil method, um, solid method, um, textures, leaves, different things like that. So um, I see people are coming in and saying, mystery box and that's fine we've got a mystery box tonight I'll explain that in a minute once we get everybody in the room good to see everybody coming in already <clears throat> Janine will be here in a minute and she'll be marking everybody's names down that says mystery box our mystery box tonight is um, filled with all kinds of stuff that we're going to be using this evening so that's the hint for tonight um, So you got people coming in from all over the place. That's good. Keep getting more and more people every week. We had Jessica did another clay share demo today using our sphere mold, showing that to a whole new audience. And so we might have some new people in this evening as well, seeing how to do the pumpkins. And some people are saying like, why are you doing pumpkins this time of the year? We've actually sold a ton of pumpkin molds in the last month. And so I want to make sure that everybody knows how to use those molds because there's a few things that are different from the other clay puzzling techniques. And so things like the stems and, and that are a little bit different when you're looking at uh, creating those. So um, we're going to give it just a, another minute here for everybody to get in and, and find the, the webinar tonight. I see some people are typing mystery box so fast that they're calling it a steery box. We know, we know what you mean. Um, and Janine will be marking those names down. What we're going to do, so those of you who are new to our live events, we have a medium flat rate shipping box that we fill with goodies each week. And so if you type in mystery box, um, and we're going to take the names up until about 10 after 7 central time. We're on central time. About 10 after um, we're going to cut it off and we won't have any of, of the names. So Janine will be marking those down. She's going to put them on a slip. And the way it works is toward the end of the live tonight, we're going to draw a name out of that um, basket full of names. She's putting them on slips of paper. And then that person will have the opportunity to buy the mystery box for basically $50. It's $35 for the box and $15 for shipping. And there's usually over $100 worth of materials in that box. And so the hint for tonight is it has everything to do with what we're doing tonight. We're doing clay puzzling pumpkins. So that gives you an idea of what might be in there. Now, if somebody gets it and they decide that they really don't have a use for what's inside there, um, we're not going to force you to take it. What we'll do is, is we'll ask. You need to be here when we do the drawing. And we'll ask if, if the person who, who gets that box and we show the contents, if they decide that they want it, they just type in that they love it and they want it. And um, we'll send them to our website to pay for it and then we'll ship it out to them. If they decide that they don't want it for some reason, we'll just draw another name out until we get somebody. I think we've only had that happen once that, that we've had to draw a second name. So don't feel bad if you get it and we open it and you're like, oh, I don't I don't have a use for that. Or I already have it. But some of the stuff that's in there tonight is brand new stuff that nobody has seen yet. Um, but we might be working with it tonight. So that'll give you an idea as well. So um, I see... Somebody wants a mystery Bob. I'm not sure who mystery Bob is, but I'm sure Janine knows that that's supposed to be mystery box. So um, we got a, a good group in here. We're going to get started. So if you didn't see the pumpkins, um, this is just one of the many techniques. This is the bark texture. I'll show this this evening. Um, you can take that same technique or really any of these techniques, and you can, with the popularity of gnomes, you can put a gnome in there. We're not going to do the gnomes tonight. I do have a live recording that um, shows how to do the gnomes and I'll kind of explain tonight what I did with the pumpkin and how you insert your gnome inside there. So I'm going to flip the camera down and this will be my work surface here that um, you'll see where I'm, I'm doing the techniques. And throughout the night, um, we do these lives for free because we're not out doing workshops in person. Hopefully soon we'll be able to do that again. 
but throughout the night we're going to show some of the products that we're using and they are all available on learnfiredarts.com and um, you can order them and so the, the first item we're going to be working with these are some brand new molds these are the new mini pumpkins and there's a set of three different ones they're item number 10 under the um, live event specials and there's three different molds that come in that set. So we're going to be working with these molds this evening. Um, the molds, if you're not familiar with them, they have a Velcro strap. They're two pieces. You open them up, and we're going to work on the insides of the molds to do our clay techniques. So I'm going to set these two aside, and we're going to be working with this, this pumpkin here. I'm going to set the Velcro strap over here, so I've got that. Um, one of the, the techniques is um, using leaves and different textures and things that you can place inside the molds and so I'm going to be working with some of these rubber leaf forms and I'm going to place some of the smaller ones inside of this pumpkin now the key anytime and it's you know this technique isn't just for the pumpkin molds it will work as well for um any type of, of the molds that we've got, whether it's vases or whatever, um, you can do the same technique. So a lot of times these recordings, whether it's a coil technique, a solid technique, whatever, you can do it with any of the forms. So the leaves have a textured side and they have a smooth side. When I lay these inside the mold, I want that textured side facing up. And the reason that I want that is because otherwise, um, when we put the clay in here, it's going to make the impression of the leaf, but it won't have the veining on the leaf. So I'm just going to kind of randomly lay some of these leaves inside here. I'm going to do three on each side. I'm going to set the rest of these aside. And yes, we do sell the rubber leaf forms on our website as well. You can use real leaves and you can use other types of things in here. What I like about these rubber leaf forms is they have some depth to them. So you'll see when we're done and we pull these pieces out of the mold, you'll see the, the, how thick or how deep into the clay these leaves go. If you use real leaves from outside, you'll pick up the veining and things on there, but because they're not as thick, you don't get as defined of an edge on the um, leaf. So, and we're in Wisconsin right now. It, it's been remarkably nice here over the, the past couple of weeks we've had temperatures in the 50s and even into the 70s um, it's been raining here a lot but we don't have any green leaves on the trees or plants or bushes or anything outside so I'm going to be working tonight with um, a low fire um, clay that has a little bit of grog and people always ask well what type of clay can you use with clay puzzling techniques you can use virtually any type of fired clay so whether you use a low fire clay body you use a mid-range like a stoneware um, or you use a high fire range of like a stoneware or a porcelain you can use any of those clay bodies with these forms these are made with earthenware bisque they're cast pieces and they will absorb moisture so when we take the clay and we press it inside the mold. It won't dry and stick to the mold, but it'll pick up the, the form and the shape that we're working with. The reason I like a clay body that has a little bit of sand in it, there are smooth clay bodies and there are clay bodies that have sand and there are clay bodies that have um, grog in them. So grog is busted up fire brick and it's real coarse. And so when you take a piece of clay to tell if it has sand or grog in it or doesn't have anything in it, if you take it and you squish that between your finger, um, you can usually feel, especially if there's grog, you'll feel a real gritty feeling to it. With sand, it has just a little bit of a texture. And when it's a smooth clay, it's like, squishing butter between your fingers if the clay is soft enough. The clay should be very flexible. You should be able to impress your fingers into it real easily. If the clay is too dry and it's really thick and hard and you can't bend it like this, it's not going to work real well for the technique. So you need to get that clay soft or get some new clay. Um, but if it's kind of firm and you can't easily stick your fingers into it, there are techniques where you can put like some wet paper towel inside the, the bag and leave it overnight. Some people will slice it into thin strips and put layers of, of wet paper towel between the clay to soften that up. I always tell people if you have the bag of clay, 
poke holes with a screwdriver all over the bag, go as deep as you can <clears throat> into the, the bag and into the clay, and then dunk that into a bucket of water so that the um, water will work into those, those holes in there and into those indentations, and um, it'll soften that clay up overnight. Then pull that bag out and leave it sit for a little while, and then you need to usually wedge the clay. Um, but, but make sure that your clay is, is soft and pliable. You're going to tear off pieces, and I usually tell people you want these pieces to be at least the thickness of what a cast piece would be. Um, so, And sometimes they'll go a little bit thicker, especially with these leaf forms, because they will, if you press the clay, and the, the clay that you start out with is real thin, um, your leaves might come through. So go a little bit thicker with this technique than... Um, what your you would what a cast piece would normally be probably double the the thickness and so the bigger the piece the thicker these pieces of clay will be I'm going to tear off pieces of clay and I'm going to flatten them out and I usually make them big enough so that they cover pretty much the entire leaf because what you'll get anywhere that these pieces of clay meet up inside the mold you'll get lines and that's where the term puzzling came from so I do, I usually don't want lines going through the middle of the leaf and I'll tear off pieces of clay and use them, um, or press them first over the top of the leaves, and then I'll fill in the spaces in between. And this will give you um, a solid piece. And I usually mix the leaves up so they're kind of going in different directions, like I don't have them all aiming straight up on here. I've got some kind of going to the side and some kind of going downward on there. Once I've got um, the leaves covered, then I'll go back and I'll fill in with more pieces of clay. Now, I don't want to end up getting um, the pieces super duper thick, and I want to try to keep the thickness um, uniform throughout. Someone asked what happens if they're too thin. If they're too thin, your piece um, will collapse when it comes out of the mold, um, and you might have problems when you peel the leaves away if they're really super thin. When you peel the leaves away, um, they'll actually rip holes in the clay. So, you know, clay, if you can pick clay up locally, um, it's not really super expensive. And so I, I tend to go a little bit more on the thick side than the thin side. Um, and I want to keep it uniform in thickness. So um, I don't want an inch thick over here and a half an inch thick over here. So I'm trying to keep it somewhat uniform thickness throughout because as the clay dries, it shrinks. And if you have an area that's an inch thick and an area that's a half an inch thick or drastic differences in thickness, where it's thinner, it'll dry faster than where it's thicker and you can run into problems with the clay cracking. If you want to hang them with Edison light bulbs, what type of clay should I use? If you want to hang them with Edison light bulbs, so if you're making like a pendant light, I think I had mentioned in Jessica's um, workshop earlier today about making pendant lights with the, the spheres, um, you really can use any of the clay bodies because these clay bodies are going up to, when you're firing them, um, even the low fire is going up to over 1,900 degrees. Your stoneware is going up into the 2,000 degree range. Um, so really any of the clay bodies will be fine with, with Edison light bulbs. The higher temperature the the clay that you go with if you go with a mid-range it's going to be more durable than um a low fire clay as far as how strong the piece is if it bumps something or bangs something but as far as the heat from an edison bulb any of the clay bodies really will work um, uh, there's a couple questions from a little bit ago and you might have even talked about this do you have the extruders in stock now? Yes, the extruders are finally back in stock. For those of you that have been waiting for those to come in, they are available and we've shipped, oh gosh, I don't even know how many we've shipped out in the last week. And we've got um, orders still going out through this week. We're hopeful that by this weekend, um, if we keep working 24 hours a day, we'll have all the orders out. And when I say 24 hours a day, it's literally been like, 18 hours a day um, <laughs> packing stuff. So, but yeah, the extruders as are back. As far as um, orders go, can you offhand remember if all the clay shear orders have shipped? No, they haven't. Um, there are some like the rubber leaf forms. We've got our last shipment of those coming in this week. And so um, we've got some of those that will be going out later this week and this weekend. By Monday, 
everybody from ClayShare should hopefully have a tracking number. The exception might be um, some of the international orders. We're hoping to have those ship complete, but because we don't want to ship partial orders to internationals because of the cost of shipping, um, those will might go out a little bit later, but I'm really hopeful that they won't. And there's only three or four international orders, I think, that haven't shipped at this point. So we appreciate everybody's patience on it. We've had a, a lot of orders in the last month. So on this one, I already did this. I kind of smoothed the clay out. Everywhere that I press the clay in here, I can see lines where those pieces of clay meet up. So what I did is I kind of took my fingers and I dragged across on here to kind of mash that clay together because normally you would do scoring and slipping as you would um, put two pieces of clay together. But because we're pressing it against that bisque form, we can press really hard. And what I want to do is I want to drag and just really mash that clay together so I don't see where those pieces met up. And I did that on both sides. Now, you got to remember, you've got those rubber leaf forms under there. So the reason I press really hard as I do that is I want that clay to get pressed against those leaf forms and really pick up all the details. If I want, I can go back over, and a lot of times in workshops, I just use dry washcloths, and I'll use that and go back and just press it and make sure that, and, and so you can see the texture as you press that towel and you know that you've pressed everywhere in the mold when you see texture all over on that clay. And that will ensure that you've got um, it pressed well so that you've, you're picking up those leaf impressions in there. All right, now to add, oh, a question. The, orders, the extruders aren't still on sale though, right? No, the extruders are not on, on sale. Um, unfortunately, the shipping on those, because on a $50 order, um, the shipping is free um, on the Shimpo, the Night ex extruder. It's free anywhere in the U.S. On the uh, Kemper extruder, the gold one, it's free um, only in the U.S. 48. Unfortunately, Hawaii and Alaska, we can't fit those in a flat rate shipping box to be able to offer free shipping to Alaska and Hawaii. I just had a, a, an order last week that um, was going to Hawaii and it was it, it was less than five pounds and it was like a 12 inch by 12 inch box and it was and it was maybe a 50 60 dollar order the shipping was going to be like 80 dollars on that if we fit it in a medium flat rate box it's 15 dollars roughly for shipping and that's why with Alaska and Hawaii um, we we try to do the anything that'll fit in those those flat rate shipping boxes. Before I put the molds together, I want to remove any clay that sticks up above that seam line. So I'm just using a ribbon tool. You can use a, a needle tool or anything to run along the edge of that mold, scrape away any clay that's sticking up above. If you don't do this step and remove that clay. When you put the mold halves together, you're going to have clay oozing out the sides and the mold won't fit together nice and snug. And before I put them together, I'm going to add a coil of clay. And so you can, you know, hand roll a coil. You can use um, an extruder to do a coil. It doesn't need to be a perfect coil because this is just going to be extra clay that we're attaching going around on just one half of the mold, not on both sides, just on this one half. It doesn't matter which half you do this on. We're just going to add that coil of clay because what it's going to do is when I put these two mold halves together, I need to have some extra clay there to squish up and attach it to the other side. If I don't do this extra coil of clay, there are little areas along the edge where the clay might not go up to the edge. And what will happen is without that coil there, I'll be dragging clay from one side to the other, and it'll create a thin area on that one side. So I want to have that extra clay to be able to fill in that gap where there is. So as I flip this over, um, I, I usually wrap my hands around so that this clay doesn't flop out. And it, it 
probably. Of course, now when I want it to, it won't pop out. Um, but sometimes on especially bigger pieces, as you flip them over, and if it takes you longer to do your puzzling in there, the piece can get a little bit dry and it'll want to flop out. So I usually wrap my fingers around to hold that clay as I turn it over so that it doesn't flop out from uh, the one half. And then the Velcro strap that comes with it, I um, put that on and then I kind of hold with one finger here. I hold that strap nice and snug and then with my other hand I bring this one up and I pull it over and wrap it so that it attaches. Now on the inside it's really hard to see in there because it's dark and so we're going to use, and I can't get my hand inside these mini pumpkins. On some of the larger ones, if you have small hands, you might be able to get your, your fingers inside there. <clears throat> We've got this handy dandy little press tool. There's a light on here, and there's a ball end. There's a bigger foam ball end on this one. Because this opening is smaller, I'm just going to use the wood ball. And if I can, you can kind of see in the camera as I put this down there you can see where the tip of the tool is with that light and so I'm going to go in and I'm going to squish that coil over onto the other half of the mold and attach those two sides and what I look for on the inside when I do workshops is I don't want to see the edges of that coil oh and just to let you know um, I had said we were going to stop taking names down from mystery boxes um, 10 minutes into the, the live. So you don't need to type in mystery box any longer. Janine has the list and she's cutting the, the sheet apart right now to make the little slips that we'll be drawing from. There's a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what, well, what is your opinion of the mini extruder? Uh, the mini extruder, so there's, and I'll show you the, the different extruders when I get Someone to the extruder pumpkin. Good for mini projects, yeah, that real project. mini one, the like $15 roughly mini extruder, um, it, it's like a syringe. And so if I was doing really like the little bitty eggs or really small things, that works fine. But to do a pumpkin this size, you would be loading that little mini extruder and extruding probably... 30, 40 times to get enough to do a little pumpkin like this. Um, and I'll show you, I don't have the mini extruder out here, but I've got the other ones and we'll talk about that when we get to the extruder technique. Are there more questions? Um, um, what is the point of the outside of the mold being textured? <laughs> this just happens to be that the, the mold itself has a texture on it. And you'll see on the inside, you do get a little bit of that texture on the inside of the piece. Most of the molds are real smooth on the inside, but some of them do have a little bit of texture. Okay, and then the last question is, and someone else answered it, but, well, first of all, one person did say that these free lives actually cost her more money. <laughs> True, yep. Um, and then um, sometimes you run a coil around and sometimes you do a loop. When do you do which? Yep, and so on the solid technique where we're doing something solid like this, that's when I use the coil going around. The loops are done when um, I'm doing Loose. the coil or the extruder technique. Or the open ball. Yep, okay. the open. That's why yep. Carol Warnicky, she could she could answer questions for you. Yep, Carol. that's good. And I know I've, Carol messaged me right before as I was oh, setting up for the, and some she said questions. She and tell you she was sorry she forgot about the lives. No, that's she fine. She said she could go broke from your free lives. Yep, so. yep. Um, so yeah, and I'll get back to you later, Carol, to answer your questions. So one of the things with the, the pumpkin molds is the stem on these. You don't need to go with the clay up into the stems. We're going to actually make stems separate on here. The inside of the mold gets so small where the stems are that um, it, it doesn't it doesn't really leave you much on there. But sometimes when you go to pull the mold apart, <clears throat> that clay might be caught in there a little bit, and so the mold doesn't want to pull apart. If that happens, and this is where the pumpkins are a little different from all the other shapes, normally I avoid pushing the clay up into that area, but I did it on this one, and once I take it out, I'll show it to you. But if you find that it's catching there, and as I try to pull this apart, I can see the clay inside there, and I pushed it up into that stem. So what you can do is you can take like a wooden tool or a, a popsicle stick, and you can kind of go in there and just press that clay down 
and it might kind of, as you open it up, it might rip a little bit of clay off on the top of there, but you can see what happens on the top. And don't worry about that because we're going to make a stem that goes over the top of that. On the, the piece itself, you can see all the lines where all the clay pieces met up. That's the puzzling. It looks kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And you can see your leaf forms. And at this point, if you don't see the smooth side of the leaf when you open this up and you see the textured side, you put the leaves in the wrong way. If you did that, it's not a big deal. Peel it away, place it back over it, put it inside the mold, and repress it with the tool on the inside. You should see that smooth side showing when you take that out of there. Um, on smaller pieces like this, I can just roll this mold over and usually just give it a, a little bit of a wiggle and that pumpkin or the piece will come out of the mold. Normally, I would feel the bottom to see how <clears throat> squishy it is. On a solid piece that this uh, that is this small, I can take it out and I can stand it up without any problem of um, the piece uh wanting to collapse. On bigger pieces, I would have more concern about the piece collapsing, and so I might leave it in half of the mold for a little while. Now where the seam line was on there, um, you'll usually get kind of a more of a line showing than you may want. You can use a wooden tool, you can use a metal rib, and just kind of go along that seam line. You can smooth out some of that clay that's um, kind of a little bump on there and then I usually just kind of use my finger to drag across and smooth that out. I don't, and any of you have taken workshops from me, you've heard me say a million times, I don't put water on the tables because most people have a tendency to want to dip into the water and they get their piece so wet that it's so soft and it wants to collapse. After this is dry, you can always go back with, with a wet sponge and smooth out imperfections on here. If I didn't want these puzzle lines on here, I would press that much harder when I put the clay in. The harder you press, <clears throat> the less lines you'll have showing. Then I'm going to take, I'm going to get a drink first. Um, someone who has an international order in Canada that hasn't shipped is wondering if it's too late to add on. They can still... Yeah, just send me a, a private message, and um, I know there's an there's one order sitting up there right now. I know that's going to mm -hmm. Canada. That's going to ship later this week, and yeah, there's one or two other ones here. So, okay. <clears throat> and then somebody asked if the hand extruder is on sale. I don't know if that means the extruder. Yeah, the the extruders right now. Um, <laughs> we bought every single extruder that Kemper had. You can't even we can't even get any more of those, and we we have very few of those. And Shimpo, we just got a lot of extruders, and they just got another shipment in. And with the free shipping, the, the extruders are basically at retail, um, and then you get free shipping because they're over $50 if, if you're ordering them in the U.S. Um, so the, the rubber leaf forms, I'm just going to use a needle tool from a basic tool set. And what I want to do is I want to pick up just the edge of the leaf somewhere, and I want to just pop it out and pull that out and you get that nice impression in there. <clears throat> so I'm going to pull out all the leaves. Now I do this after I do any, any smoothing. I smoothed out my seams on there. Um, I leave the leaves in until I'm done doing that so that there's less chance of me messing up um, the leaves with trying to scrape away clay and smooth out and, and eliminate imperfections. And the rubber leaves come in all different styles and sizes and shapes and I'll show you we have an assortment um, and they're sold individually as well. So that gives us our pumpkin with our leaf impressions. Now we're going to set this aside, um, put the leaves aside here and then we're going to make the stem and so you can decide how big you want that stem to be and so I'll take a piece of, of the moist clay and I make kind of a, a cone shape with it and depending how long I want it to be and how much I want this to twist around will determine how long I make this. And so I'll usually kind of set it on top, and right now it looks like a carrot coming off the top of my pumpkin, but I want to make sure that it's not too big or too small for this pumpkin. And so this is just about right. On the, the bottom part that's going to attach to the top of the pumpkin, I want to kind of pinch this out. So it's kind of like doing a pinch pot where you just kind of, I'm taking my thumb pressing into the middle, and on the outside, my my index finger and my naughty finger are kind of pinching as I work my way around 
opening this up. And what I want to do is I want to taper this edge of the clay so that it gets real thin on the edge and that it's not super thick on the inside. And this will kind of, this indentation in here will kind of go over the top of this here. I don't normally attach these at this point. And the reason that I don't is because it's a lot easier to paint this. And if you're going to do glazes on here, when you fire it, you can set that on there. The glaze will fuse together like glue. Um, if you're going to do it with acrylics and stains, um, you can just glue those on and let it dry. It's a lot easier to paint if you don't attach the leaves and you don't attach the stems. So some of you might be thinking, well, if you attach that on there, you might get air trapped in between if this isn't real snug on there. That's another reason that I don't slip this and attach that on top of it. I'm going to take, to add texture to my stem, I'm just going to use, again, a wooden sculpting tool, and there's lots of different shapes and sizes that come in, you know, pottery sets, and I look for something that's got kind of a, a sharper edge on it, and I'm just going to take and scratch texture into my stem, and these lines are going to be kind of straight, and then we're going to give it a little twist that's going to make it a little more gnarly looking like a pumpkin stem that's kind of twisted and if you do glue them on, what type of glue do you use? I tend to use like a, a silicone or an E6000, um, something that's kind of a thicker glue that's like a silicone-based glue um, because I can kind of goop it up on the inside here, and when I put it on there, it's going to attach. If I use a glue like, say, crazy glue or super glue, that's usually really fluid. And sometimes when you set it on there, it may or may not attach on there where that thicker glue or even an epoxy would work really well on there. Someone asked, is there a risk of it sliding off in the glaze fire? Well, if it was like off to the side, there would be a risk of that. These stems are going to sit right on the top. If you're concerned about it sliding off, just fire them separately and glue them them on after. But generally, on, on pretty much all of the pumpkins, they sit right on the on the top. The most of the glazes and things, and I should I shouldn't say they don't flow because some stoneware glazes and crystal glazes and things will flow and move in firing. But there usually isn't enough movement that this is going to slide or move. When you set that on there, it's kind of <clears throat> contoured to fit the top of the pumpkin. It's very unlikely that that's going to slide off. But if you're concerned then just fire it separately. Now, once I've got this textured, I'm going to give it kind of a twist. And so it kind of gets more of a gnarly texture that the stem looks like it's kind of twisted. And then I can take and just gently kind of bend this and curl it around. I don't want to just take it and bend it because I'll snap it off. So I just kind of gently, a little bit at a time, kind of twist it so that when I set it, on top of my pumpkin, and I'm, I'm kind of pushing this down on there to make sure that it fits well all the way around and looks like the pumpkin grew out from that, that stem. Now, if you want to make dimensional leaves, you can use real leaves. You can use the rubber leaf forms, and there's all different types of leaves. The ones that don't work real well for making dimensional leaves are the maple leaves and, and they will work but they're a little more challenging because you've got these openings that go real deep in there. Um, sometimes they get a little heavy on here and these kind of want to break off because it gets real narrow there. These work great for doing impressions in the clay. I love the maple leaves but for making dimensional leaves that are going to come off of here I, I usually tend to avoid those because there's plenty of other leaves. There are actual pumpkin leaves there are oak leaves, there's um, dahlia leaves, there are um, mum leaves are really good. I love the mum leaves on the fall pieces. And a lot of times I'll do a little bit of a mixture of different leaves on here. And then there are just plain traditional, they're actually lemon leaves. It doesn't look like I actually have any of those here. I may have been out of them the last time that I was using these. Um, but anyway, I can make some dimensional leaves that will come off of the top of here. And again, those I usually don't attach until I am ready to, or after I've painted it, 
I will attach them. And the way I get the leaves to stick on is after I've painted them, and if you're glazing it and firing it, you can do your firing, and then masking tape them, put some glue on the backside, masking tape them in place, and once that glue dries, peel the tape away and your leaves will stick on there. To make actual dimensional leaves, I'm going to take and flatten out some clay. Again, I probably want to go about a quarter of an inch thick with this, even though um, it... Uh, I just totally lost my, my train of thought. Even though, oh, I know that I, I want the leaf to look thin. I don't want it real thick and clunky. But if I make this clay too thin, I mentioned earlier about with your pumpkin, if you make the pumpkin too thin, when you peel the leaf away, it could rip a hole in the pumpkin. The same thing can happen here. Do we have some questions? Um, someone was wondering if they suck a toothpick in the, in the, down if it would. Oh, if, it, if you put a toothpick into the clay, to hold the stem in place. It, it, it would, but at, at some point during the firing, the wood of that toothpick, when it gets hot enough, is going to burn up and turn basically to a powder, and um, then your, your stem and your leaves are, are free range on there. Um, and then someone was talking about if they need to bring, what tools to bring for retreat, but that's... You don't need to bring anything no. for retreat. We have everything yeah. for you. Just bring yourselves and an appetite and um, boxes for and packing materials if you're taking your items home. If you're flying in, we'll ship the items back for you. You don't need to bring boxes and paper on the airplane. Someone wants to know the approximate size of the leaves. So, so the leaves... Next to your hand. Yeah, the uh, leaves range from... I've actually got a tape measure here because somebody always asks about the, the size dimensions size. of something, so I keep a tape measure handy. And on the website, it'll say the dimensions of the leaves, but they'll range from um, about an inch and a half up to about five to six inches. I think this oak leaf is the longest one. And then there are bigger leaves, but in the small assortment... Um, the biggest is going to be that oak leaf, and you'll get you know leaves like this that are a little bit wider, and there's just a really good variety of, of lots of different leaves. And they're reusable forever. I've never worn a leaf out. All right, so once I've got that, that clay about a quarter of an inch thick, then a lot of people will take a needle tool, and they'll sit there, and they'll, they'll cut around the edge, and that's fine, um, but it usually puts cut marks in my foam mat that I'm working with. So in workshops, I tell people, just take and peel away that excess clay. The majority of it will peel away. And then you're left with this really thick, clunky-looking leaf. And, you know, if you put that on, on top of your, your pumpkin, it's just going to look really thick and clunky. But you need that thickness on most of the leaf so that it will peel away easily. So to, to make it look, the illusion that it's a thin leaf, I use my thumb to kind of bevel the clay just on the edge of the leaf. So I'm kind of pulling my thumb, pushing down and out, peeling just the edge of that away and beveling it. So it's still thick in the middle, but it gets thin on the edge. I leave it thicker at the stem of the leaf so that I've got something to grab onto, and then I can grab that rubber leaf, and I can peel that away, and I've got this nice dimensional leaf that's thin on the edge, but nice and thick and durable in the middle. Then I'll kind of set that against the pumpkin, and I can just have that leaf going straight down. Whoops. Some of them might go straight down, but then there are others that I'm going to take, and I'm going to kind of bend them so they look like they're kind of growing out, and then they might bend a little bit like that. So you can kind of make them so they're a little bit wavy and not just so straight and flat. And then I'll just take those leaves and set those aside. I fire them separately, paint them separately, and then, like I said, tape them on later. Because if you go and you score and slip a bunch of leaves around here, imagine how challenging it's going to be to get behind there when you're painting. So that's why I, I do it separate. Plus, just picking up and moving them and loading them in the kiln and handling them, it's a whole lot easier to do this. And so in a workshop, if you're if you're teaching classes and you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to keep all these leaves straight? You know, they can take and carve their initials in the back of the leaf, or what I usually do is I give them a board or a surface to put all their leaves on. And then when I fire them in the kiln, I lay all the leaves right around their pumpkins. And sometimes I'll lay like a post 
between them so that I know all of these leaves go with this grouping of pumpkins and all of them on this side go with that grouping of pumpkins. But you can make a variety of different leaves that will go around your pumpkin and, and make them all so that they're, you know, a little bit different so they're not all just perfectly flat looking leaves. And I usually make a few extras so that if I drop some or sometimes you start gluing them on and, and you get a little carried away with putting the leaves on, I always have extra leaves around. So that's the basic technique for the leaf technique. The next one that I want to show you is the, the bark technique, which is what I did on these pumpkins. And this texture not only works on the pumpkins, it works on the, the spheres, it works on vases. It gives a really cool, cool texture. And you can see the leaves on top of this pumpkin, how I've got them a little wavy. They're not all just flat. You can see how the stem is kind of gnarly and twisted around on there. Um, so that gives you an idea. But this, this bark texture is great. If you're into doing washes with glazes, if you're into mid-range and high-fire stonework glazes, those glazes are beautiful on these pumpkins because you've got all that texture and if it's a glaze that that breaks or flows into deep crevices or as you brush it on it puddles in those deep crevices and you get those multi-tones or breaks in the glaze this is a great great texture for that someone asked before about gluing the leaves on and then someone else is it's the same for the e6000 yeah like the e6000 is is a great thing or any silicone thick a thick clear drying glue like that what is the finish on that Pumpkin that, bark texture. that bark texture is actually um, dry brushed with acrylics. It's hard to and see so, on camera, but yeah. Yeah, so this pumpkin was actually, I'm working tonight with white clay, and when I get to the coil technique, I was going to talk more about using color clay. This actually was done with a terracotta clay. So on this technique, I didn't have to, if this was done with white clay, I would have had to have base coated this with a darker color and then done dry brushing with the acrylics, the softies on here. But because the clay color was already red, I just did like a wash of a dark brown and then dry brushed with orange and dry brushed with some yellow. And on the leaves, I dry brushed with some, a couple different shades of green and a little bit of yellow. And sometimes I'll take kind of fall colors in and add some rusts and purples and, and things in those leaves. So... The clay body that you work with, you can use to your advantage that you eliminate having to base coat a piece. And with the coil technique that I'm going to show after the bark technique, um, that's really nice because the coils of clay, if you want to paint the inside of the piece, and somebody was asking me earlier today about painting the inside of a piece, um, if you use red clay, all those coils inside are already red. And so you can dry brush the outside of those pumpkins. If you're doing um, shows and selling finished pieces, it makes it so easy to do those because that red clay is already basically base coated and all you have to do is dry brush some orange and some yellow and you'll have a really cool um, color combination on those pumpkins. Now, if you want to do fired finishes, you could do that same bark texture using... Um, washes of colors on there um, you could do you know solid glazes you could do some layering with different glazes on there um, and don't just think of pumpkins as orange um, you can do pumpkins that are blue you can do pumpkins that are purple so look at some of those stoneware glazes and stuff that have really cool breaks in the in the glaze and um, you can do all kinds of combinations of colors on here does duncan or mako now still make their wood glazes no, those wood glazes, like the, the, they were like a matte glaze that had chunks of like darker glaze chips, basically. And there was kind of like a crystal glaze, but the crystals weren't hard. They were soft. And so as you brushed them on with a fan brush, those dry chunks of glaze that were wet would kind of streak on there and give you kind of a wood look. But oh my gosh, those have been gone for a long time. Those were cool, though. Um. What cone are you firing to if you're only finishing with acrylics? If I'm finishing with acrylics, I'm usually working with a low-fire clay body, and I'm probably firing that to cone 04. 
Um, if I'm working with stoneware mid-range glazes, I'm still firing the, the clay pieces to 04, and then I'm doing my glazing probably to cone 5, cone 6. If I'm going real high fire, I might be going all the way up to uh, you know cone 8, cone 10 for that glaze firing. What I'm doing is, uh, as I'm talking here and answering questions, this is part of a bark texture pad. We've had so many orders for these that I'm working with one that I had actually dropped at one point and broken. Mm -hmm. And it, it still works fine because um, it has this texture. And so I'm just taking pieces of clay and pressing them randomly on here to um, to pick up this, this texture on here. And so this is basically ceramic bisque. And we have um, an oak tree that has really cool bark on it. And we actually press slabs of clay against the tree. And um, it'll uh, get that nice texture on there. And it works great for doing this technique. Janine just had to step away. And um, so Cameron is here now watching to see if any questions pop up on here. But I'll usually do a whole bunch of pieces of clay like this. And I'm just tearing them off pressing them to pick up that bark texture. And then when I lay these inside the mold, what's different with this technique is I'm going to have the texture side of that clay facing away from me. And I'm going to overlap these pieces just a little bit. And I'm not going to press real hard because if I press real hard, I'm going to lose my texture that I just put into them on the bark texture pad. And some of these two will stick up a little bit, where the other technique, we took a tool and scraped those away. On these, we want some pieces to stick up because we're not going to do a coil, and I'll kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, so now to attach these, obviously I need to squish them together, but I don't want to press. So what I'm going to do is just take my finger, and I'm just going to kind of drag where those pieces of clay meet, and I'm just kind of squishing that clay together without pressing down real hard because I don't want to lose that texture. They got a question? Oh, I see one. Maybe it's not popping up for you. It is on my screen. Do you sell the tool you use that cuts the clay? Yeah, I'll show you that tool here in a, in a second. There is a, a clay cutting tool that um, I really like. It's kind of like a giant cheese cutter. And yeah, the bark texture pads are available. Um, or you can find an old oak tree and, and, and make your own. But I do sell them on the website. I was surprised as I travel around the country teaching workshops. Um, some areas don't have really nice oak trees. And, and the bark, you know, you can pick up textures from just about anything on clay. And um, that that bark is a, a really good good option. I see. There's a, a question about if we sell clay, and um, we do. Um, I usually suggest that people try to find clay locally because if you can drive and pick the clay up, um, it's going to be cheaper than having it shipped. Um, our postal people love us because um, we take that medium and large flat rate shipping box and we can fit a block of clay in the medium flat rate shipping box, which is 25 pounds, and we can fit two blocks in the large flat rate shipping box, which is 50 pounds. And um, sometimes those the boxes show up rather banged up. Some people have sent me pictures of them, and I'm sure it's because some postal person along the way is like, oh, my God, 50 pounds, you know, they fit into these little boxes. But um, if you can find it locally, that's going to be your best option rather than paying for the shipping because the shipping, honestly, is almost as much as the clay most of the time. So... I do. Yep, I've been to Brickyard. Um, unfortunately, last year their open house 
got canceled with COVID, much like many other things last year that got canceled. Um, hopefully that will will happen again. That's usually in July, I think, that they have their event. Right now I'm scheduled for um, the Florida Ceramic Show in August, and then I'm looking at making a few stops up in the Alabama area to do some workshops while I'm down um, south there. So we'll be posting on the website all the locations and things that as we start to get back to normal of being able to do um, workshops and stuff in person again. A few people are asking about retreat and being filled already. So I was like, oh, and then they asked if you have one later in the year. We yeah, used to do two. But. We used to do two, and we are looking at adding some dates. And, and last year we had planned to do a lot of weekend type workshops and things and then COVID hit and, and that came to a screeching halt. So we will be setting some more stuff up this year, but yeah, retreat right now, we actually actually accidentally oversold. I forgot to mark somebody down who paid. And so we actually have one person more coming than than normally we do and we can, we can make room for them. We usually limit it to 12 people um, and we've got 13 set up right now. I see there's a question about Enseca next year. Yeah. I hope to be back at Enseca next year. Um, that usually is something that we really prepare for. I see Waukesha show. We are planning to do the Waukesha show as well. And then, oh, how do you sign up for the Florida show? Oh, and did you did you actually take a retreat off of the website since it's full? Because somebody's looking for it, and I said it's full, but it's no, full. it's the retreat is actually still up there, but it won't allow anybody to reserve or purchase that. Okay. Um, it's inventoried and it's down to zero for the inventory right now. Okay. Now, before I put these mold halves together, um, I'm going to kind of bend these chunks of clay that stick out, I'm gonna bend them in because as I put this mold, this other half on top of it, I don't wanna have those squishing out the sides. So I bend them in and then again, I kinda of wrap my fingers around or I'm just gonna hold it on the inside of this one. And as I put these together and squish them down, here's a little bit of clay that's oozing out, not the end of the world, it breaks off. And this mold is actually small enough that I can take my finger on the inside and I can drag and squish those those clay pieces together on the other side. Um, again, I don't want to take that tool in there and press oops, straight down really hard on there because then I'll lose the texture of my bark. So don't forget as you're working with these different techniques that you don't want to press real hard on this one. And I actually can't see in here, so I'm going to take the tool, I'm going to shine the light down in here, and just use that end of the tool to gently drag those chunks of clay across to attach the two sides. And then I can immediately open that mold up, and I've got my cool textured pumpkin. And the nice thing with this technique is you don't need to worry about the seam lines because you've got so much deep texture where all those pieces of clay meet up that the seam line isn't really even noticeable. Sometimes I'll get a little spot here that's kind of sticking up and I'll just kind of take and, and press that down. So a little bit there, a little bit on the bottom and press that down and I've got my textured pumpkin. Stem Exact same thing that we did on this other pumpkin. Make a stem, place it on top, make it as gnarly and twisted as you want. Leaves, same thing, make your leaves and they can be added on to the top of that piece as well. And so that is, is it for the, the bark textured pumpkin. The last one I'm gonna show you is the coil technique. And we're gonna do that in the third small pumpkin this one out of the way. Do you ever do custom molds for potters or possibly offer that as an option in the future? Um, I don't do custom molds. I mean, if you have an idea of something that, you know, you want a clay puzzling mold, um, that might be a possibility. But um, I have a hard time keeping up with making 
the molds for my clay puzzling molds. Some of these are commercial molds, but a lot of them <clears throat> we actually make the molds for. And there are some that I have ideas in my head that I've had in there for over a year now. Um, so I just don't really have the, the time to be able to um, do custom molds. But um, Petro Mold does custom molds. Um, trying to think there are other people out there, and I'm totally brain dead right now of who else is out there. There are others out there that do custom molds as well. When are people going to be able to start signing up for the Florida show? And do you know what you're going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Um, it's in it's in August, and right now I'm trying to get through next week of getting all these <laughs> orders out. And once that's done, then I'll get more than four hours of sleep a night, and I'll be able mm -hmm. to actually get that figured out. All right, so this is... So, oh, when do they, like, put that available to sign up? Is that... It, it'll actually, it'll be on my website, and if you are on my email list, if you get emails from me from LearnFireDarts.com, um, you'll get notifications when those are set up, and we'll have all of the Alabama stops on there as well will be will be on that list. And anything else that comes up, we'll, we'll have that on our website. The show itself doesn't handle the registration for workshops. So we've got a couple of different um, extruders. So this is the one. This still has the, the Shimpo name on it. And Shimpo is um, also known as Nidic. And so, whoops, I lost my slip here that was on here. So the, the new ones, this one I've had for years that I've used, and the new ones have the Nidic logo. It's the exact same extruder. It's a different sticker on there. And so this extruder is um, the shorter one. This one will ship anywhere in the U.S. This is number eight on the live event specials, and it's $64.95, free shipping anywhere in the U.S. because we can fit this in a flat rate shipping box. It comes with an assortment of dies. Each of these extruders that I'm going to show you come with different dies. I'm not going to take time to show it now, but on the website it shows all the dies that comes with each one. So that one is number eight on the website. And I'm going to work with this one tonight, but I also have this Kemper extruder. And the, the main difference between these is the length of the barrel. So the Kemper one holds almost twice as much clay and... Um, I like that for workshops because I have to load it less frequently. Now, somebody asked earlier about the little mini extruder, and that little mini extruder is, get in the camera view here, is probably about that long, and it's about the diameter of my thumb. And so it holds so little clay that to do a pumpkin like this, I don't remember how many times I said, but you probably would have to load it 50 times to get enough coils of clay to do that. So I recommend one of these. Be careful. There are a lot of knockoffs of the Shimpo extruder on the market. I've gone to studios and taught at studios, and they're like, oh, no, I've got extruders. You don't need to bring extruders. And I go to use their extruder, and the, the triggers on them, I don't know what happens, but you can squeeze and squeeze and squeeze that trigger, and clay does not come out, or it comes out at a snail's pace. Um, so be careful. There are, are knockoffs that look like this. They're silver, but they are not. A lot of them aren't as good a quality. Can you kind of go over some of the orders from late February that haven't shipped yet? What Because there's a lot of people asking. So the orders from February that you have not received yet, everybody should have a tracking number by Monday. We're down to the end of the orders, and they will be shipping out by Monday. You should get a tracking number. And if you put in an email address, it, it's kind of crazy some of the stuff that's come up. People are like, you know, they, they'll they contact me and say, you know, has my order shipped yet? And I'll be like, yep, we sent a tracking number. Our website automatically sends the tracking number, and FedEx and USPS automatically send a tracking number, and they'll be like, oh, well, I never use that email address. So if you put an email address in your order, it's not so that we can spam you a bunch of stuff. It's so you can get notifications. So um, check your email. If you don't see it, make sure you check your spam folder because sometimes automated stuff like that will go into the spam folder. And if you need to, just send me a message and I can check. I, I check lots of orders every day and can tell you when stuff is, is shipping. But everybody's orders should be shipping by Monday 
Um, we're down to the end of, of the orders. The orders that came in on the 23rd and the 24th, um, there were close to a thousand orders. And normally in a week, if we get a hundred orders, that's a lot in a week. And then every day that followed the 23rd and 24th, there were hundreds of orders that came in every day after that. And we've had hundreds of orders coming in every week since then. Um, so we're, we're almost caught up. And we're grateful for all the orders. Yeah, but, but it, it, it's been overwhelming. And so, you know, we, we, we thought about hiring more people to help. And the worst time to hire people is when you're slammed and you don't have time to really train them well. And the packing of the orders right now, if you could see this room, there are boxes everywhere with orders that are just waiting to be packed. The molds have to be wrapped multiple times. There's lots of packing material and things that go into it. And the packing is what's taking the most time. And so um, when I looked at the orders earlier this week, I'm like, okay, if, if I keep working from six in the morning until about one in the morning or two in the morning, <laughs> I'll actually get all the orders out this, this week. And Janine is working hard too on it and and so we we should have them out and i i apologize for the time it's taking but right. it's kind of very unusual the amount of orders that we've received and, and we'll be caught up this week so there's a quick question about extruders do you or are you going to carry any extruder dies for hand i don't know it says does for probably dies yeah dies for handles not the straight but the ones that are a little fancier yeah i've had requests for that and i've actually got um a customer that has a 3d printer and i have to get with him and get some samples of different handle dies he said he can do just about any design if somebody has something that they want that's really unique and there's a shape that you want um he can he can make dies for us so um, just message me if there's something in particular, but that is something we plan to add to the website at some point. Someone wanted to know if you're going to still do lives after you're traveling more, and I said no. <laughs> Janine's <laughs> telling me no. <laughs> she was like, well, you did them a few times a year when you were traveling. It yeah. depends on the schedule. Yeah, it depends on the schedule. Um, so I'm going to work with the shorter extruder. The triggers on these are basically the same um, there are, like I said, different dies that come with each one. You'll see those on the website. Um, as far as squeezing the trigger, some people have a harder time. If their hands aren't real big or they don't have strength, I get a lot of people that say, you know, I have a hard time squeezing this trigger. So what I recommend, if you find that you have a hard time gripping this and squeezing it, is put that extruder so that this plunger, this is the thing that, that as you squeeze a trigger, this moves in and pushes the clay out the other end. So if you put that down on the table, you can bring your whole hand and you can push down on that and you can get really good leverage. Sometimes instead of sitting, if you stand up, you can really put some good pressure on there and the clay will extrude out the end. I usually put my hand around the end of this so as the clay comes out, it doesn't get caught on the edges and break on the extruder it will um, kind of come over my fingers and it, it tends to not stick on there. So just put that, whoops, put that down on the table and you can get really good leverage with your whole hand rather than trying to grip and squeeze like this. So the length of the tube, the only real difference is you're forcing a little bit more clay through this Kemper extruder. So you might find that you have to have a little bit more strength or pressure to get that clay through, but otherwise they both work equally as well. Again, I like this one in workshops because I don't have to load it with clay as frequently as I have to load the short one. The other difference is the dies that come with it that you'll see on the the website. So to um, oh, um, it, this was a while ago, so I, I might have, you might have said something about it. But this one of the dies has three holes. Yeah, so the Kemper extruder, the gold extruder, the longer one that I showed you, that comes with this three die or three hole die and um, the Shimpo one comes with a solid blank die. So this one comes with a solid blank die. You can take that blank die and take just a power drill and a drill bit and drill as many holes as you want in there. I find that with that size coil three to four is usually the most that I want in there. Otherwise your coils just kind of mash together when they come out. This one does come with what I call the spaghetti die that has 12 small holes in it that, that's good for like beards and things on the gnomes and stuff like that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
take and I'm going to um, squeeze out a coil of clay that will fit inside of this extruder. And I want it to be about as long as, as the extruder is. Um, and a lot of people will take the extruder apart here. This will come off, but it's not necessary. Whoops. So I usually leave this end attached. And what you want to do is you want to push in on this trigger and pull back on the plunger. And it usually I, I stand up or I, I got to kind of lean back here to get it in the camera. Sometimes it'll get a little squeaking. Some people will spray the inside of this with oil and that's fine. It's kind of acts like a lubricant. Some people will just put some water in there um, and that will cut back on that squeaking sound that you'll hear and it'll make the clay kind of go out a little bit easier. And the thing about using oil like WD-40 in there is I just worry about it getting on your work surface and then you touching it and good, getting oil on your hands and then you're touching pieces and you go to glaze them and then the glaze is repelling and not adhering to your pieces. So WD-40 will work, but I usually kind of caution people with that. Your die fits into the end of this threaded piece. That just gets screwed on and then you start squeezing your trigger. It'll work air out first, so don't expect clay to come out instantly, but once you get all of that air out, you'll get multiple coils of clay. I'm working on some craft foam here that I get at the craft stores, and I'm actually going to stand up because I can get the coils out better when I stand. Okay, I'm doing it that way. If I have a hard time with it, I can put it so that that plunger is down, and then watch what I can do. So I can push my whole, try to get it, I'll do it this way. I can get my whole hand pushing down, and then I wrap my hand around the top like this, so that those clay coils come over my fingers and they don't get caught. Because if I don't do that, they tend to want to get caught on the, the plastic top on here. So I'm going to do a whole bunch of coils. Don't do coils too far in advance because they can dry out kind of quickly. And you want to try to work with longer continuous coils versus breaking off lots of little pieces. I'm going to attach anywhere that I have the end of a coil. I'm going to attach it rather than having it hang out there because if it just sticks out, it's usually kind of sharp on the end. So I just make sure that that overlaps somewhere. And then I just start taking these coils and I start um, adding them on the inside of the piece. And I do kind of figure eights so that these coils overlap one another. They crisscross. You don't just want them going up next to one another. You want them crisscrossing. Anywhere that you have the end of a coil, you want to put that on top of another <laughs> coil again so you don't have sharp points sticking out. Use your dry washcloth or a dry sponge to gently compress them in the mold. You can use your fingers. If you have long fingernails, sometimes those will cut into the coils and that doesn't um, always work real well. When I start with another coil, again, I put it on top somewhere so that as I do my figure eights on here and I get to the end of a coil, it um, ends on top of another coil. And I just keep adding coils in here and crisscrossing and kind of doing my figure eights until I get the whole half of the mold filled in. And periodically I'll go with the towel and I'll press. Now sometimes people will sit here mm -hmm and they want to break off little bitty coils and make individual little loops and make all these little loops in here. The reason I suggest going with a longer continuous coil rather than breaking them off and making all these little loops and putting them in there is every time you have a break in that coil, the piece is more fragile. So you want to try as best you can to have longer coils inside here without making a lot of breaks in them. Occasionally, you'll go back and you'll fill in some spots where you have a big opening. You might use a small little loop or coil. What kind of oil can you use for when it was like squeaky or whatever it was you told them to use oil for? <laughs> then, no, that was, I was just saying that some people oh. will use W, they'll coat the inside of that metal tube with WD-40 um, or cooking oil um, so that it kind of lubricates so that the clay slides easier inside there. And that's fine. 
it, you can, but that's where I was saying I don't always recommend that because people start getting cooking oil and WD-40 oil and you start touching pieces that you're going to be glazing and you're going to have issues with the glaze repelling. So um, I usually don't recommend that. I'll, I'll say put water, run some water inside there before you put the clay in and that will also act as a, a lubricant in there without creating um, problems. Okay, and then someone asked what size drill bit you used, but then someone else said, I think you'd use the size that you want the hole to be. There's, it doesn't, you, yep, that would, have, that would have been my answer. This bit that I've got that I used on here, I believe is a 3 8 inch um, to make this size coil. But yeah, you can use whatever, look at the ends of the drill bits and decide how big of a, a hole you want in there. The one that comes with the, the Kemper extruder, we've got, um, we're the only ones that sell it with the three hole die. And that one is the same one that I'm using here, which I believe is a, a three eighths inch. Okay. There is a couple. Let's see another question. Oh, if the spaces are too big, will the piece hold up through a glaze firing? I will talk about that right now. Yep. I'll, and we'll see if there are other questions and then. Oh, can I make them at home in the morning and go to the studio in the afternoon to work? them will they if, if you're talking about making the coils ahead of time um that's a good question um one time i thought oh i would do i was going to be doing a workshop and so i took a plastic garbage bag and i put it out on a board and i extruded all kinds of coils inside there and i thought i'll be ahead for making coils in this workshop well by morning it was like the, the moisture inside that plastic bag had just pretty much it was so wet inside there that the coils were all sticking together. So um, if you're talking about making the coils and then kind of working with them later, I don't recommend that. I usually kind of extrude what I'm going to use within about five minutes um, because if it sits out, and especially if you've got like air vents and air conditioning or heat blowing, fans blowing, those coils will dry out pretty quickly um, if they're sitting out for too long. Again, I'm just going through and I'm filling this in. Now, I'm purposely leaving some big spaces in here. And I always tell people, if I can fit my thumb into that opening, it's too big of an opening. And so I will take, and this is where you may find that, you know, you'll have one spot where you need to cross a coil over. Um, so I might, this is a, a case where I might just break off a little piece of coil and run that across and press that to fill it in. You can also look for on pieces, sometimes you'll have long narrow openings so your thumb may not fit in it, but if it's a real long skinny opening, you'll want to have some coils crisscrossing. And the reason you want to do that is it's going to add stability to the piece. If you have really big openings in here and you take it out, that piece is going to be really, really fragile. Um, on the other hand, if you make this almost solid that you don't see any white openings in there, you're going to still see the coils you just won't have as many openings in there. So sometimes people freak out and they're like, oh my gosh, I got too many coils in here and I can't see any space. When you take it out of the mold, you'll still see the lines of, of the coils in there, so don't panic. Now before I do the, the final step, before I put these together, I want to add some coils on the very bottom of the piece because if you picture taking this pumpkin out after you've done all your puzzling and you put the halves together, um, these little individual coils on the bottom are going to be fragile. When you go to stand that piece up and it's dry, those coils might want to break off. So I usually, on the very bottom of the piece, I will run some coils kind of back and forth on there to cover about an inch, which on these pumpkins it happens to be like just the, the basically the bottom of the pumpkin. And so I'm basically filling that in, I'm pressing it, and that is going to add a lot of strength to the bottom of this piece so that I'll be able to stand it up and squeeze out a few more coils here for this other side. I'm going to do the same thing on this bottom. I'm going to add some coils just going back and forth. I'll press those with the towel. Now, here's where it gets different with the coil technique versus with the, the leaf technique or the solid technique. We put a solid coil of clay inside that one half to squish back and forth. On the bark texture, we let pieces of the bark texture stick up so that we could squish those together to attach the two halves. 
Well, on this piece, we don't want to put a big thick coil in here and then squish that over to the other side because then you'll have the solid strip of clay all around on there. So we're going to create loops to attach the two halves. And with these loops, especially when they're narrow coils like this, again, I want to try to do kind of a long continuous coil. And on one half, of the mold, and I'll hold this up so you guys can see it in a minute. On just one half of the mold, I'm going to create these loops that stick up. And I don't want them to go more than an inch high, and I'll show you in a couple minutes why that, why I say not to go more than an inch high. Um, and again here, you could sit and, and break off all these little loops and do individual ones on there. But if you have a longer continuous looping coil, it's going to be stronger than a bunch of little individual coils. Do you make these with both low and mid fire clays? Oh yeah, yep. You can do it with low fire and oh. mid fire and, okay. and high fire if you want. Just try to remember to restate my question. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so and you, I mean, you kind of stated it in your answer. Yep. Um, is one clay better than the other? Well, your stoneware clays are going to be more durable than a low fire clay. So th with the coil techniques especially, the hotter the clay goes, the stronger that clay is going to be because stoneware clay bodies and porcelain clay bodies vitrify and they close up so tight and they're not porous like an, an earthenware or a low fire clay body is. So they will be more durable if you go with a higher higher temperature clay. Now those little loops, and, and again, I only did it on one half of the mold. The other half is just sitting there. Don't do these loops. A lot of people make the mistake of they're working and, okay, you've got your first half of your mold, you're filling in with coils, and then they'll add the loops to that half, and then they'll grab the second half of their mold, and they'll start doing their coils in there. Don't put the loops on that first half that you did. Put the loops on the second half, and the reason I say that is because I mentioned before how quickly these coils can dry and firm up. You need to be able to take and bend these inward so that when we put this mold together, those coils won't get caught in between the two halves. And they need to be bent in far enough to compensate for the thickness of the clay on this half. So as I put them together, I don't want these loops getting crushed and bent and pinched. So I need to bend them in so that they're almost aiming inward. And I mentioned earlier that you don't want to make these taller than an inch. And the reason is because if you go real high with these, when you bend these inward, they get kind of top heavy and they want to break off and fall into the middle. So if you, if you find that they're breaking off and falling in, then you probably have gone too high or you didn't press those tight enough as you attach that on there. One of the reasons too that I use a towel in workshops I'll see if it'll show up in here. You can see the texture on the coils in there. So what I look for when somebody says, okay, I think I'm ready to put my mold halves together, I'll go over and I'll look for areas where I don't see texture, and I'll go like this, and I'll see a spot that's smooth, and I'm like, right there, that's not pressed hard enough. I don't see texture in it. And so that towel textures, and it compresses those coils. Normally, again, you would, if you were attaching two pieces of clay, you would use slip and you'd score. Can you imagine doing that with all of these connections everywhere that these coils overlap? You don't need to do that um, because the towel will compress it. Now, as I flip this over to put the two halves together, I'm going to have the one that has the loops sitting down, the one that does not have the loop sticking up, because that way, again, I can wrap my fingers around it. So as I place that on top, the coils won't flop out. And as I set it on there, I pull my fingers out. I can put the Velcro strap around this. And then I can take my tool onto the inside, turn my little light on here. And I can go, I got this other strap from this other mold is sticking here. And I can go down inside. Now I don't wanna drag the tool across the coils. I'm just gonna take it, I'm gonna press those coils where they overlap onto the other side. I'm just going to press those hard enough that they attach to the other side. You don't want to drag this tool in this technique. On the solid technique, you can drag the tool, 
but on the bark technique and on this one you just want to kind of work your way around and press it and then I can take and I can remove the velcro strap and I should be able to wiggle this open it up and I've got my coil pumpkin again watch the stem on there if this wants to hang up and not pop out just take a, a wooden tool and kind of dig in there and pull the top of that down if it got too far up inside there and on here I can normally the coil pieces I would leave it in half of the mold especially if it's a bigger piece this one is small enough that I can pop it out um, and then I'll just go along and anywhere that there's a little clay that got caught in the mold I can peel that away I can take a needle tool or a metal rib and I can kind of cut away any clay that kind of sticks up on there um, there usually isn't too much and then again I'll just use my finger to kind of smooth out any roughness that's there where I cut those away I'm not using water on here at this point after it's dry I can do that if the piece is bigger and it's really squishy just leave it in half the mold um, you can open it up leave it in half the mold sitting it'll be fine most pieces if even if you leave them in there overnight or for a week they will shrink and they will pull away from the mold so you don't have to worry about cracking there may be some pieces that are vases where it may get wider and narrower and flare out around that neck of the vase if you leave it in there too long it could crack as it dries so look at the mold before you leave it in there too long um, and just kind of pay attention to that and on here too it's the same thing with doing the, the stem I don't want to push this one down and, and fit it on here too well but basically your stem would sit on top of there and your leaves you would make um, to put on top of there as well so that is the the basic coil technique are there any other questions no all right so I just want to show you a few of the other things I showed you guys the the Shimpo extruder we've got the Kemper extruder whoops is item number nine and that one is 64.95 that one is free shipping in the US 48 Hawaii and Alaska we can't ship this one for free that one we've got lots of these in stock we still have a I think a half a skid of them sitting um, upstairs we've got the whoops the rubber leaves I just dropped one out of here one own. Um, the rubber leaves we are waiting we have another shipment of these coming in um, but we should have all of these back in stock soon there is an assortment number six is the assortment and it has the mum leaves the lemon leaves the grape the maple the oak the dahlia the I think maybe I said the mum the pumpkin leaves um, there's strawberry leaves there's grape leaves and that assortment and that one's on sale for 75 that's item number six or you'll find item number five we just numbered all of the small leaves the individual ones they're twelve dollars a set and there's usually three or four leaves in the individual sets like this one is the the lemon leaf that I call the traditional leaf because it's just kind of a plain leaf there's four different sizes that come in that one and they're twelve dollars for that set or you can get all of the small leaves for 75 for that assortment we also have um, different dies for the extruders and like the dies that come with the Shimpo extruder if you buy the gold Kemper extruder but you like some of the dies that are with the Shimpo one you can buy a set this is the whole set of all the dies that come with the Shimpo extruder they also have you'll see some other dies on the website this one is a kind of a cool thing that the Shimpo came out with they're different dies and there's a cap that goes on there there's usually four different shapes on there there and then there's a cap that covers up three of them so that you only extrude one of those out um, you'll see those on the website you'll see blank dies if you want a bunch of blank dies to drill holes in you can do that as well how long is the sale usually the the specials are up there for two weeks and so for the next week they'll be numbered the numbers that I show you and then next week the like number one two three four five comes off of there but they still stay in the the live event special section you'll find the press tools we've got those on there as well um, I don't have this one numbered but you'll find that in with all the clay puzzling molds that we've got the tools and they come with the light um, we did have a lot of people order we have a 36 inch one of this 
The only time you would need the 36 inch one is if you buy the big floor vases. We have big floor vase molds and you need that longer handle. Otherwise, this 18 inch handle is sufficient for any of the other mold designs. We had a lot of people order them in the last month and I think everybody that I've talked to is like, oh yeah, I didn't need that, that, big, um, that big long one. So this is, I'm actually gonna flip the camera up here to show this, this is, um, a brand new mold. This is a new jumbo pumpkin. This one is item number four, and it's on sale for $59.95. It's normally $79.95. And this one is a really nice pumpkin, and it goes good. I'll show you the, the assortment that this one goes really well with. Um, but it's kind of a, a narrow, but really big in comparison to this other one, our traditional pumpkin. Um, stand back a little bit further. Mm -hmm. I'm watching the closed captioning. Oh, yeah, the closed captioning can be. It's, it's usually really pretty, good. pretty good. But th that, this pumpkin, the new one, goes really well with this set of three. And this is actually, happens to be item number three on there. And this one is the traditional pumpkins. And they run from $29.95 and up. You can buy them individually or you can buy the set of three. And so there's three different sizes to that one. And then we just added this new jumbo pumpkin as well and then there are the and the, and those molds there are the ones that i use for all of the finished samples that you see up here and then there's the slender pumpkins there's three different sizes of these slender pumpkin molds this is the medium there's a large back here and then the small and that one is item number two is the slender pumpkins and they run from 34.95 and up and they're also available in an assortment as well. Um, so those are all the, the items that we've got um, this week. You'll see other stuff on the website. Somebody the other day said to me, and I, it kind of cracked me up. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize, but I saw why she thought it. She thought we only had the event specials. And so she never on her phone, it's kind of different how you get to the different tabs on there versus when you're on the computer. So there, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff on there. There's colors, there's, we're gonna be adding kilns, pouring equipment, um, there's slab rollers, the extruders, there's Mako, pretty much their entire line. We're slowly getting all of the colors added. We have most of their colors in stock now. So you'll find lots of different stuff on the website. So it's not just the specials, there's a lot more on there. And, and any order over $50, um, free shipping in the U.S. 48, free shipping to um, Hawaii and um, Alaska if it fits in any of the flat rate shipping boxes. Um, we're also going to be doing FedEx has a flat rate shipping box as well, so we're looking at those right now too. So, um, did we have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the mystery no, box. I think ready for that. All right, so we got the mystery box here. Janine's going to hand the little Halloween bucket. I had to go with the a bigger container to um, put the names in. I'm mixing them up here. I'm not looking down at them. Make sure we mix them up and I'm gonna pull one out. And it looks like we've got Sherry, I'm gonna say Auger. I think Sherry was in another workshop earlier today as well. So. Sherry, let us know that you're still here. Just comment in there. I'm going to flip the camera back down and we're going to open this box up and show you what is in this box. They type the letter L into their Google search. Lauren Fired Arts is a Yeah, Tanya, you've been there a few times. Well, I told you that it would probably have to do with what we're, we're working with tonight. And so inside this box, you get the set of the three new smaller pumpkin molds. Um, they'll also come with Velcro straps for each of the pumpkins. So you get all three of those. And then you'll also get um, the Spectaclear. We're adding all of the, we've had a lot of people, the Stardust I've shown several times in the live events. This is the one that's like sparkly glitter. It's a fired blaze. And they have other um, Spectaclear colors. There's peppermint that's like a red and a green speckle combination. There's autumn, which is kind of oranges and browns, and I think there's a little yellow speck in that one. And then there's celebration that kind of reminds me of like Mardi Gras. It's got purples and I think yellow 
and maybe some blue specks in there. I can't remember. Um, and so there's a four ounce bottle of each of those in this assortment. And then you also get a lot of you, when I did the eye workshop, um, the eye kits came with the um, Tenot liner brush. We've since added, we've had a lot of people saying, oh, do you have one that's even finer than that? So we've now added um, a 20 ot liner brush. So you get a sample of the 10 ot and the 20 ot in here. And I'm going to hold this against this pumpkin because it should show the difference in the tip. So this smaller one here is the, the 20 ot versus the 10 ot. And you can see there is a difference. The 20 ot is a little bit finer than the 10 ot, a little bit shorter than that. So you get a sample of each of those. These are um, Moderna brushes. They've got acrylic handles. So even if you leave them in water, they're not going to swell up and, and peel and have flaking paint like wood handles. Great for doing line work, design work, outlining, eyes, lashes, things like that. They're awesome brushes. I think Sherry likes it. All right. Yes, thank you. That's good. Well, congratulations, Sherry. And and lots of people were congratulating her. Lots of happy. That's good. I know everybody would like to win a, to, to get the mystery box. And so, um, what Sherry, what you're going to do is go into the Learn Fire and Arts website and item number one under the event special section is um, pay by dollar amount. And so you can go in and just, it's basically set up as a $1 item and go in and put, change the quantity to 50 and it'll ask you to enter your information and credit card. You can pay with PayPal, however you want to do it. And then we will get the shipped out to you. If you want to add anything else to it, you can order other items as well. So um, I think that's that's all I got for you guys tonight. We, we managed to get done in an hour and a half. That's Ooh. pretty good. Yeah, now we can go eat supper. Um, so can if I you... Yeah, so if you do have questions, you know, feel free to message me. Um, the comments sometimes on these posts get to be so long, and if you guys, like, comment within comments or you respond to somebody, sometimes it's really hard to track those down. So if you have a specific question, it's probably better to private message me um, to get an answer. And some days I get hundreds of messages. So if I don't get back to you immediately, don't be offended. If you don't hear back from me within a day, you might want to just shoot me another message. I try to keep track of them. But in Messenger, um, messages can get buried really easily when a lot of stuff comes in. If you email me, it stays in my inbox until I respond to you, and then it gets taken out of there. So email info at claypuzzling.com is probably the best way to, to get an answer um, from me on stuff. Now, next week, we're going to be gone. So there won't be a live event next week. I oh, hope you guys will survive. You're not doing it from Florida? No, I'm not going to do it from Florida. I thought about maybe going in and just, you know, doing like a question and answer type thing, but... I don't want to guarantee that it's and that I'm going to be there right at seven o'clock to do that, and I'm probably going to be sitting on the beach somewhere sleeping, trying to catch up on sleep. So, I'll fall asleep, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I did one time. I was on a trip and I had a, a day in between teaching workshops, and I went and sat out by the pool at the hotel, and it was in it was in Modesto, California, in the summer. And it was hot. Mm -hmm. And I sat down in the lounge chair after I came out of the pool. You know, you're a little chilly. And I just sat down in the lounge chair. And I was going to dry off a little bit before I went in. And I fell asleep. And a few hours later, I woke up. <laughs> and I was a lobster. <laughs> and I had to go teach a workshop the next day. And I could hardly move. So I won't let that mistake happen again. So um, thanks for joining us tonight, you guys. I will see you in a couple weeks when I get back from that trip. Um, I'll be only home for a, a day or two, but we're going to be doing um, clay cottages. We're going to be doing some really cool things, and, and I'll be posting some stuff with pictures and that of, of the things that we're going to do. And you can do you can make them into bird houses and little fairy garden houses and things like that. There's lots of cool stuff that we can do. So I look forward to seeing everybody again in two weeks. Take care, and, and thanks again.